Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that sweet intro. So kind. Can we give it up for our pastor? Yeah. Oh gosh. I, I said our pastor because he's my pastor too. <laughs> Um, hey, I just want to give it up to um, everybody that's at home trying to homeschool their kids right now. Woo! Man, <laughs> this week has been rough, and I just want to encourage you, if you are a grandma, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, any human that is trying to homeschool your kids virtually right now, you are doing great. I don't care how you feel, you are doing amazing, and... Uh, just felt like I needed to encourage you in that because I got to encourage myself in that. So, <laughs> But anyway, hello, Oasis family. How are you doing? Um, many of you know me, but I also realize that a lot of people don't know me because we're in a different time right now. We are online, and we got a lot of people joining us for the first time. So if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Christina Lowe. I am Julian's wife, which you probably know, but I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, I am the funnier of the two of us in the relationship. To those who laughed really hard, no. So if you, I know it's hard for some of you to believe, but I am the funnier one. Um, also, I was here first. I was here first. There was a time when more people knew who I was than they knew who my husband was. It's true. I came to Oasis in 2007. I had just moved 3,000 miles away from my home in Florida. And from the very first Sunday I stepped foot in L.A., I came to Oasis, and it's been my home ever since. And honestly, I'm just so grateful and humbled that our founding pastors, Philip and Holly, would even entrust Julian and I with this church um, because it is so sentimental to me and so many people. Oasis was the place that when I came from 3,000 miles away from everything that I knew that I was able to get to know Jesus. I was able to develop lifelong friendships that I now call family. And I'm just so grateful. So thank you, Philip and Holly, so much for uh, just for starting Oasis Church and giving people like me a place where we can get to know Jesus. And so thank you for that. Um, so I moved here 13 years ago, and my dream, like many people that come out here, was to be in entertainment. Mine, in particular, was to be on television, but now I'm a pastor, because that's what God does sometimes. So <laughs> uh, I did not grow up a Christian. I grew up what I call a part-time Catholic. So basically, that means you go to Mass on all the holidays. You go on Easter, Christmas Eve, Christmas, and then you make your communion. So um, in Catholicism, confessions are a big deal. And so this message to you will be a lot of me confessing just some things that I have been through in my life, and I just hope that you are encouraged by it. And leave it to me to read from one of the most obscure books in the Bible. Uh, it is only one chapter long, and it is called Philemon. And <laughs> when I get to heaven, because I'm getting there one day, um, <laughs> I'm going to have so many questions for God that probably won't matter when I get there, but one of the questions is going to be, why couldn't everybody's name in the Bible just be easy, like right. Peter, yeah. Paul, yeah. Thomas, mm -hmm. James, even Jesus is easy, but no, in this book we have Philemon and we have Onesimus, oh. so say that ten times fast, oh. Philemon, 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 no, okay, great, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> But in the book of Philemon, uh, it's basically an account. And I, I say account because I think sometimes when I hear the word story or character, to me that registers like it's not true. Mm -hmm. And so even while Philemon is a small book in the Bible, and many people might not know where it is, it's before Hebrews, by the way, um, it doesn't mean that it's not something that you can't be encouraged by. It's not something that doesn't matter. It's, not, it's still the truth. It's still the word of God. It still can be used to transform lives. Yeah. And so I thought it would be cool to read from the book of Philemon. So we'll start in Philemon uh, 1, because there's only one chapter, <laughs> verse 4. And we'll be reading from the New Living uh, Translation. And it starts out and says, um, well, actually, let me give you a little bit of backstory first, because we're not going to read the whole thing. Um, so Philemon is a book written by the Apostle Paul, and it's a letter to Philemon. And Philemon was a brother in Christ, brother in the faith, and although he was a Christian, um, he was also a slave owner and a slave master. And 
Paul is writing this letter on behalf of Onesimus, and Onesimus just happens to be uh, Philemon's slave who has run away from him. And in the midst of him running away from uh, his slave master, he encounters Paul. He gets saved. He gets to know Jesus. And he starts doing the right thing, the good thing. And then at some point, Paul says, ooh, yes, but you have to go back. Like The right thing to do is to go make right. So Paul does him a favor and writes to Philemon and appeals to him as a brother in Christ to accept Philemon when he gets back to him, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And that in and of itself is just so powerful. Um, So it opens up in Philemon verse 4. It says, I always thank my God when I pray for you because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Okay, let me give you a little context. (laughs) Paul was on house arrest. Like, he wasn't going to church every Sunday and just living free and living his best life. He was on house arrest, but yet he said he was thankful. Let's talk about who I'm not in this story. I'm not Paul. (laughs) I am not Paul. Because if I was on house arrest, my letter would probably go something like this. Dear Julian, (laughs) this is not what I thought it was going to be. They won't let me go. Could you put some money on my books? I'm really hungry. Maybe send me a Twix or a face mask. You know, I heard Corona is like real bad these days. So could you hook me up? But it definitely would not sound like I am thankful. And I'm, I'm just so in awe of how Paul is thankful. And Paul is thankful. Why is he thankful? He is thankful because he heard. He heard. He heard. Well, let's take a second to stop right there. My message is called, in, uh, in, in line with all of the alliterations, Love and Liberation. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, liberation is freedom. And sometimes we end up in bondage because we don't know God's love enough that we could just hear about something and it make us thankful. Wow. We have to be involved. Wow. We have to be part of it. And so um, we can't just hear that Julian preached a great word. I want to be the one to preach that word. I want to be up there. Or I can't just hear about someone being financially blessed. I want to be financially blessed. Or I can't hear about someone getting a house without me wanting a house or needing to have a house too. Um, So we stay in bondage by saying, where's mine? Where's mine? But Paul was thankful just by hearing. And... He heard of his love. In Philemon 1.5, it says, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of God's people. And so I just had this thought. I was like, what is it about love? Um, because why didn't he say, I'm thankful about your good deeds or your good works or the miracle and signs and wonders that I see you doing? Like, what, what was it about hearing about love that made Paul thankful? And this is why I'm not Paul. Because I'm not thankful when I hear anything. (laughs) I'm more thankful when I see something. I'm thankful when I see the change in the person that's getting on my nerves. Or I'm thankful when I see the provision in my finances because I'm stressed over the budget. I'm, I'm thankful when I see things go my way in my life or I go in the direction that I, I thought it was going to go. But Paul was thankful when he heard about their love. So what is it about love? John 3.16, probably the most quoted scripture in all of the world, says, uh, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So what do we do to earn God's love? I I would love to think that I could do something to earn God's love. I would love to think there is something that Christina Lowe can do. I could pray enough. I can give enough. I can serve enough. But this doesn't say that. It says, for God so loved the world. There's nothing that, there's nothing that we did. There's nothing. He just, he loved us. That's, that's what happened. And the cool thing is God doesn't need to see anything to love me. He doesn't need to see me do something because he is love. And love is liberating. So the fact that Jesus can love me despite me, is just so encouraging to me. And so I'm going to tell you who I am in the story. (laughs) I'm Onesimus. (laughs) I'm Onesimus because I am a runner. 
You're like, I don't want to have anything to do with conflict. Like, I run if things don't go my way, which is part of the reason we, I was joking with Julian because he banged on me last week about how he had asked me like a hundred different times to preach, and every time I said no, and he's, he's right, that's true. <laughs> but in my defense, <laughs> no, I don't have, there's no defense, I have nothing. Um, but I think that it's because It's just like Onesimus. He ran because he was enslaved. And I ran from this opportunity right now. Like what you're watching right now, I ran from because I was a slave and I've been a slave to insecurity and comparison. And even just being in ministry. You know, I think a lot of people could assume that when you are a pastor that you somehow grew up in church. I think the auto assumption is that I grew up in church or this was somehow the the trajectory that I had dreamed of for my life. And it's not my story. Like, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't, I I thought I was coming out here to work in TV. And so when God switched those plans, um, I ran. And so, you know, sometimes we can be like, God, why don't you just call me to something that's more natural to me? Like, for me, it would have been being a rapper. (laughs) (laughs) Am I right? Or like a world-class choreographer. Like, why couldn't you call me to something like that? Um, So where do you go to hide when you're enslaved by something? You know what my place is? My house. Ooh, I love a clean house. (laughs) Julian, do I love a clean house? I love a clean house. I love a clean house so much that sometimes I clean my junk drawer, y'all. Wow. I know, I clean my junk drawer. (laughs) You know know that drawer that has everything in it? Okay, who else has a junk drawer? Marvin, you got a junk drawer. (laughs) Marvin and I are about the same age, so I know he has a junk drawer. It's the drawer that has, like, loose batteries and old bills and, like, (laughs) and popsicle sticks, like, things that make no sense. But it also has the things you need. It has, like, a hammer and some nails and a screwdriver. But the problem with the junk drawer is that because there's so much junk in it, when you go to find the thing you need, you can't find it because there's so much junk in it. And I think sometimes that's what our lives can be like. This is like one big junk drawer. Wow. So like, I know that confidence is in there somewhere. Wow. I know joy is in there somewhere. But because of the things that I've been through, I've collected all this junk, or some of the things that I've done, I've collected all this junk so much that I can't find the thing I need when I need it amidst all the junk that's in my drawer I call my life. I lost my place, but here we go. That was the Lord, y'all. And and honestly, sometimes when I'm cleaning my junk drawer, I'm not cleaning, I'm hiding. And I can hide behind motherhood sometimes because I'm really good at motherhood. You know, people say, oh, you're such a good mom, you're such a good this, and I'm really confident in that. And it's really easy to hide behind something, um, and you can hide behind something you're confident in to the point where nobody will call you out on the thing that you're being disobedient to. Wow. So I can be such a great mom, and I can hide there. So no one's going to call me out that I'm not up here preaching or I'm not doing the thing, the other things that God has called me to do. And these things are very important. I'm not saying, I'm not saying being a mom is not a great thing. I'm not saying the fact that I, I can do certain things is not a great thing. But sometimes um, we're hiding behind this to-be list, I mean to-do list, instead of the to-be list. Like God wants us to be. Yeah. We have so much to do. I have so much to do. And I know faith without works is dead, but it's only the work that is done rooted in God's love that matters. Why? (laughs) Because the to-do list without God's love is like slave labor for the enemy. Onesimus in this story was only a slave or was primarily a slave to Philemon because Philemon didn't show him love. Philemon was a Christian, but he didn't love Onesimus like a brother. And it got me thinking, (laughs) man, here's Onesimus who's run away from being a slave. He finds Jesus, so now he's trying to do the right thing. He's working with Paul in the ministry, and then Paul's like, okay, man, now i got to send you back. Can you imagine being Onesimus? What? (laughs) 
oh, my bad. I, I thought when I met you that I was going to be released from that. I found Jesus. I'm working in the ministry with you. You're going to send me back <laughs> to the thing that I was a slave to? Julian, I think that if I just hide behind this, oh, if I just clean enough and I just make the house look good and I just support you, that you'll leave me alone about the call that God has on my life? But you want me to preach? (sighs) (sighs) Have you ever been in a situation where you've done something wrong and no matter what you try to do to make it right, it doesn't seem to work? Philemon in this story actually had a legal right in this time to punish Onesimus for running away. And I think sometimes we punish people too. Um, And when I thought about this, I had this example of this boyfriend that I used to date, and he cheated on me, y'all. I know. Sorry, babe. It's my testimony. Um, And he... And he cheated on me. And it's not okay to cheat on somebody. Like, but I stayed with him. And, and I stayed with him, but I held this thing over his head forever. So it was like no matter what he did, no matter how much trust he tried to rebuild, I mean, I just held it over his head. So why stay with him and make him now a slave to this thing that he did? And I think sometimes that's what we can do. Like, we can hold people hostage to our feelings because they've done something wrong. And a lot of times we hold ourselves hostage to what we've done wrong. And this was really the appeal that Paul was making to Philemon. Now, when he comes back to you, don't hold him hostage to this thing he did, man. Let him go. He's free in Christ. He knows the Lord. I'm sending him back to you as a brother, not as a slave. And I think sometimes, though, because we punish other people, we punish ourselves, sometimes we think that now the enemy has a right to hold us hostage and hold us in bondage. This whole book in Philemon is about um, the enslaved and who they're enslaved to. Yet in the midst of trying to escape slavery, Onesimus meets Paul. And in Philemon uh, 1, verse, verses 10 through 12, he starts his letter, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. He calls him his child. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much of use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. Paul could send Onesimus with his heart because he had the father's heart. When Onesimus encountered Paul, he became like a son to him. He wasn't just the guy that could help do the tasks of the ministry. He wasn't just the guy that could do all the things for Paul. No, Paul treated him like a son. So I'm wondering if you could meet someone in bondage and leave, uh, and and having found freedom because you have the Father's heart. Could you free somebody else so much because you have the Father's heart? Um. You know, I think sometimes when we, I think there's, um, I think we get scared to love people in that way because some people can get attached in like a codependent way when we love people like that. But it's not, it's the Holy Spirit through you that wants to love people like sons and daughters. He's the one that gives you that ability. You don't have to be afraid of that. Um, I've definitely been, a victim to that and afraid of that. Like, if I go too far into this, Lord, is this person going to count on me to do the things that only you can do? And God's like, no, 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 no. Even if they do, it doesn't matter. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers you to send that person out into the world. Romans 5.5 5 says, And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Why is this important? I pray that you find love from people. When you meet a Paul, I say this goes the other way too. So when you get to know Jesus and you meet a Paul, you don't have to depend on that person. You don't have to tie your life to someone. I feel like, Jamaica, you talked about this before um, in your experience in just being at Oasis for so long that you've seen people come and go and you've been hurt by that. But it's the Holy Spirit that allows people to come and go in our lives. 
and, and we don't have to be codependent with that person. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit enables us to go out there and not have to attach ourselves to a person. We attach ourselves to Jesus. Really but the cool thing about the Holy Spirit, um, going back to the enemy holding us in bondage, there's this word in the Greek, parakletos. I had to ask my husband a couple times, how do I pronounce this? Um, the original word for the Holy Spirit in the Greek is from close beside a proper, a legal advocate who makes the right judgment call because he's close enough to the situation. Wow. Are you close enough in, with the Holy Spirit that he can make the right call for you on behalf when, when you are feeling like you are in bondage by the enemy? Are you close enough with the Holy Spirit that he can set you free no matter what your circumstance is? Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times... Um, as, as the church, we seek the destination when we need to start seeking liberation. So what's liberation? I was thinking about liberation and what it means in the world. And um, this is where I get a little vulnerable and I share a pretty gnarly part of my testimony. Um, liberation in the world means a lot of things, you know. It, it, it can mean to say whatever's on your mind. Let's just say whatever we want. It's First Amendment, free speech. You can just say or live or act or do. Um, and for me, one of those things in the world that, that um, we say is liberating uh, was not liberating for me at all. And I think of like women's lib and stuff like that. And when I was 19... I was in a very abusive relationship, and I was sexually active, and I ended up getting pregnant. And there was nothing in me that wanted to have an abortion. I, there's just nothing that made me want to do that. And, but I, I live in a world that kind of says, like, this is the easy way out. This is your body. This is your choice. And so I started to justify why it was okay to make that choice. And I'm not here to argue whether it's the right choice or the wrong choice. I'm just saying I've never felt liberated by making that choice. There's nothing about that that has made me feel liberated. And I think we talk a lot about making laws um, for abortions, and, and I get that. I get the fight for that. But when I look back on my life and my choice, I made that choice because of an absence of love. Absence of love from the father of the child. Absence of love even from my parents who didn't really know how to guide me through a situation like that. Um, I wasn't in church. Definitely didn't. What I saw was picket signs outside of a clinic. I didn't, I didn't see love. And if I had, I probably would have made a different choice, to be honest, looking back. So, and with that comes so much, so many other things. Bondage, guilt, shame. For the longest time, I was enslaved to the feel that I'd never have kids. Why, why should I be able to have kids? I don't deserve to have kids. Here I go. I'm holding myself hostage to the choice I did. I don't deserve to have kids because I had an abortion when I was 19. I know that was not right. I know I shouldn't have done that. So it's okay if you don't want to let me have kids, Lord. And I think that's so part of what this story is wow. about Paul's appeal to Philemon to liberate Onesimus once he returns. So what do you need to be liberated from? There's so many things in my life. That's just one. But for a long time, I was enslaved to my budget. I was so fearful of finances because of the way that I was brought up. What are some things that you need to be liberated from? I would love for you to be liberated from your fears. I would love for you, and I know the Lord would love to be, love for you to be liberated from your performance. I know that the Lord would love for you to be liberated from your identity in your creativity. You know how I know it? Because I had all the same things. <laughs> and Paul did his liberation all with a letter. A letter that not only liberates, but he also offered to pay any debts that Onesimus might incur by going back to his slave master. In Philemon 117 through 19, it says, So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. 
If he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. Wow. Does this sound like the gospel to you? Yeah. Sounds like the gospel to me. Jesus, with his own blood and with his own hand, said that he would repay the price that we should have had to pay for our sin. He paid the cost for our soul. He paid for us to have eternal life by dying on the cross. So Philemon is not just some obscure book in the Bible. It is the word of the Lord. And one last thing, I can't help but think that in this book, which is a letter of an, a person enslaved to his slave master, it's kind of like what the Bible is. It's God's giving us this letter that says, I've written, I've given you everything you need. I'm appealing to you in this letter, in the word of God and the Bible, yes. that if you would do these things, wow. if you would treat people this way, mm-hmm. that you could be free. Wow. But we don't do it. Yeah. But we don't do it. And I think in many ways, that's why the church hasn't been as effective as it could be. Because we don't pay attention to the very love letter that is the word of God. You know, there's some really disturbing things that happened in Beirut um, about a week ago. And there's this really great organization that goes out to these countries that have been war-torn. And they go to rebuild them. And they go to provide resources. And they go to love on people. And this... um, Organization is called Preemptive Love. And I looked up the definition of preemptive just because that's what I did. That's what I do. And I'd heard of this organization um, before, but I I I knew what they did and I kind of heard about them, but I was like, why did they call themselves Preemptive Love? So I Googled preemptive and it says, serving or intended to preempt or forestall something, especially to prevent attack by disabling the enemy. In John 3, 16, God's love was preemptive. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that those who believed on him would have eternal life. God's preemptive move was to send Jesus to die for our sins and disable the enemy from sending us to eternal condemnation. You know... In Matthew 22, 36 through 40, and this is the last scripture I'll read, it says, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love is a commandment. What's a commandment? I command you to do something, but doesn't that sound mean? (laughs) I command you, Marvin, to love your neighbor. But God says it's a commandment because we can do it. God doesn't command us to do something we can't do. And T.D. Jakes, I love love me some T.D. Jakes. And T.D. Jakes recently said in a sermon, he said, if God commands it, it means we can do it. And he used this analogy that God would never command him to be a blonde-haired, blue-eyed person. Because he couldn't do it. So God would never command us to do something we can't do. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit to help us love people. And it's this love that brings liberation. Paul had this love. And here's what blows me away. Look at how Paul addressed um, his letter in Romans. It says, Romans 1.1. Sorry, I lied. One more. One more scripture. Uh Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. God's love was so powerful that it made Paul serve God willingly where the enemy would love for, him, for us to, for, to serve him forcefully. Wow. 
Are we serving forcefully? Are we loving people forcefully or willingly? I, I haven't always loved people willingly. I've loved people conditionally. But Paul is doing this willingly as a bondservant. And, you know, I can't help but think, too, that Paul had empathy for Onesimus because he was a bondservant of Christ. He understood what it was like to be a bondservant. His empathy was in his own experience. And I wonder if sometimes if we could put ourselves in someone else's shoes and try to imagine their experience if we haven't had that experience ourselves. You know, I could talk to people about and have empathy for people that have had abortions because I've had one. Yeah. I can have empathy for people that are scared and, and have fears because I've had them. I have them. And sometimes we have to put ourselves in someone else's shoes to have empathy. But we can do it. And I want to pray that you, that I, that we would get the revelation that we can do this. That we can love people in a way that would bring liberation, that would free them. I pray that you can love yourself in a way that liberates you and brings you freedom. I want to pray for two groups of people. First person I want to pray for is the person who is holding themselves hostage to something you've done. And I just want to pray that the grace of God would come over you and that you would you would receive the grace of God and be free. And the second group of people I want to pray for is the one that might be holding someone else hostage. Maybe someone has done something that has really, really hurt you. And they're trying, man. They are really trying to make things right. But there's nothing that they can do in your eyes that can make it right. And, and, and they feel it, but you're staying with them or you're staying in relationship with them. And I want to pray for you that you would also just feel the grace of God in your life to be able to see that person the way that Paul was appealing to Philemon to see Onesimus like a brother or a sister in Christ Father I just thank you so much for your word I thank you for your word that transforms us that encourages us that enables us that empowers us to be more like you. Lord, your word says that you came to set the captives free. You came to bind the brokenhearted. And I just pray, Lord, that if there's someone that is holding someone else in bondage, Lord, your word says that you came to free that person. You came to free both of them. And so I just pray, God, for people that might be feeling like they can't get it right. And I pray, God, that you would release them. And I pray, Jesus, that the person that is holding them hostage would release them too. And I pray, God, that you would, as you release both of them, I pray that you would just show them how much more you want to release them. Just show them the other things that you want to liberate them from, Lord. Because there's so much that you want to free us from, God. And it is in the liberation that you will send us out to do so many things. And I thank you, Lord, that freedom is only found in you. It's not found in works. It's not found in the thing that we think that we can do to make this thing right. So would you free every captive today, Jesus? Free every captive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.